Hello and welcome to Garrock Farms. In today's video, we're getting the sprayer ready. We're putting it on the 7510. It's a Demco sprayer. And uh, we got a little bit of corn to spray. All the corn's planted as of right now on the farm. And today's date is May 21st, I believe. And you finished planting on what, May 19th? Yeah, just a few days ago. There was some big rain coming in. It didn't really amount to nothing. I mean, a couple of them fields we maybe could have gave it a couple more days to dry, but I think it's going to be good. It worked up nice anyway. And, and the first field planned, what is... May... Oh, that was... That's already up like two inches. So then we're going to see if we can get that one sprayed. The other ones, I mean, we're going to get at them this week. Do you remember what date that was planted? Oh, I'd have to look at the book again. That would have been... About already three weeks ago? Well, maybe the fifth or... First week of May? Yeah, it, it was before the last big rain system. I, I'd have to look, but it was yeah. kind of cold there for a while, but it was time. That one was time. So uh, with the sprayer here, we got to get everything hooked up, and then we got some Roundup solution in there for that we have to drain out of there because we're not spraying a Roundup ready variety. We're going to have a different mix in there, so we got to clean the tank out and put that into a different storage container so we can use it later at rinse eight on our Roundup Ready stuff. So we got the electrical hooked up to the batteries and the monitors are in the cab or the, the switch boxes, the control boxes. Dad started rinsing out our tank here, draining it. But we want to make sure to rinse it out really good, being that there was Roundup in there last time. And now we're going to run a mix for conventional corn that doesn't, that is not Roundup ready. And we don't want to have a uh, residue. Yeah, we don't want to have a part of the field where we kill or injure the corn. We don't want that. We want to do this to give our corn a better chance. So once we rinse it out, we'll probably end up priming the booms and, and uh, ensuring that we don't have any Roundup in the booms either before we go off and spray. So now we got that draining out and don't be alarmed looking at the pad, our hose is just leaking. It's not, it's not our, our sprayer, everything is caught there. But we want to do this over a concrete pad or even better in like a containment area if you were a big commercial guy. Because if you did have a spill, then it would all be caught and it's not getting into your ground. and in a concentrated form, which this isn't concentrated. This is pretty diluted down. That's already pre-mixed. That's not, that's not very potent. That's already, that's probably more diluted now than, than it would be if you were to go applicate in the field, so. Oh God, yeah, it's just, but it does, they claim it don't take much. What that is called is, is rinseate, which is a mixture of water and chemical that was left over from the last application. And instead of having to find a way to properly dispose of it and get somebody to come pick up our rinse aid or something like that, we are just going to save it and then use it for our next application of Roundup and mix it in. So then hopefully when we finish with the Roundup spraying later on this year, then we're completely out. Don't have to worry about having leftover chemical water rinse aid solution. Before we get too into it, let's uh, talk a little bit about the sprayer. Dad's had this now for, what has it been, well, it's about? Be maybe eight, nine years, bought yeah, on an auction. About, about a decade or so. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, 200 gallon, and it, it's on three point, of course. And the interesting thing is uh, you need a lot of weight on the front. And I know guys that got 300 gallon and a 300 horse tractor <laughs> just because of the weight, you know, if you get any kind of hill stuff. But the nice thing on this crooked farm, you know, you can back into your start of the field and angle it right. And, and uh, we've been, you know, through our, through our getting our license through those classes, they always talk about getting the product on the target and only the target. You know, you don't want to be lapping onto the road or a creek or waterway stuff. So I'm able to back or, or maneuver better than a trailer type all of it you know that's, those things are and then there's less crop damage too being it's on a three point instead of an extra set of tires back here you just have exactly. your uh, and the here. side hill so what happens is this the tractors on the roll and your sprayers driving you know or the tractors between the roll and your 
trailers driving on the road the whole way. It's just it's it's just physics making that happen this way. You're right. And wide row on those hills, steep hills too. We're able to avoid that. Yeah. And how many gallons per acre are we spraying? Well, so you got 200 gallon and. If, if I'm in the B2, which I don't move real fast, I don't have that much corn, so I don't, and, and uh, that'll do eight acres. And if I go B3, I can get nine out of it. So for instance, if I got a nine or an eight and a half acre field, instead of me going back with a small amount, maybe I'll just a uh, little more concentrated. The more water that goes with it, the, the more evenly. It... Yeah, so we're putting on, uh, 20 gallons an acre is what we're doing yeah. and if you're a big commercial guy you're maybe pushing more of that around that 10 depending on the products you're using but yeah you get a way better coverage with more gallons of water but then if you were doing this for a living then you got to make more passes and more, more time water and, and, yeah. and, and carry all this and stuff it's not it's not as efficient as if you were doing 10 gallons an acre but we obviously we have a smaller operation where we don't have to push for big acre numbers yeah and i can, can just we can do a better job right off the bat instead of having to do lower gallon work so i mean i can spray all my corn in one day and in today's perfect no wind, the forecast is for calm and yeah, it's, you know, it's not maybe, super hot or super cold. It's maybe three, four mile an hour wind, which is actually better than dead still because some products will lift and carry. So it's actually really nice today that we got a slight breeze. But if you get upwards of like 15 mile an hour plus, you probably don't want to spray that day. Gusty anymore. and I get concerned where it, it'll drift onto a different crop that you don't yeah, want Yeah, we don't want to kill all our hay fields next to our corn fields. And you would, you know, sometimes you have no choice. It's like every day is windy. So what I've done in the past is had times where in the evening, I, I would try to do it or in the early morning, or even then I would load up in the evening, have a mix ready to go. So first light out, I go. Yeah, when it's calm, yeah. Calm and all that. And by the time I get done with my milking chores, it's already kind of breezy. And you'll look at the flag and you'll be, oh, it's going to be too windy, especially up on a hill. So any of you in egg, probably this is probably all simple stuff you've already heard of or understand. But anyway, anyone outside of agriculture, when it comes to spraying and doing any type of application like that, timing is the most important thing. There's such a short window and your weather's got to be just perfect, not only to make your products work, properly on your field but to reduce the amount of drift and uh, a miss I think that's the biggest thing to make sure we don't damage something I mean the stuff's expensive for one thing and in our, our window you talked about like some of these products you, your corn you know shouldn't even be up yet or it, or I don't know what do you call the leaf stages you understand that yeah you got your your v1 two three four, yeah you get too far you're risking damage I mean so you you, you know, if you'd get rain, okay, you don't want to go in there, it's too wet. And then then it starts to get a little nice out, but then it's windy. Yep. <laughs> so now you can't go. Pretty soon you got a week and a half window where you didn't go, and now it's gonna, you're, you're getting. And I like to do it when it's, when it's just uh, spiking up. You know, if you do it too soon, your residual, which it means that the spray wears off before you, you need it to do something. So you, you don't want to put it on like, like we could put it on and, April before we even plant, but then by the time you get to June, it starts to wear down. So typically by fall, this product that you put on isn't doing anything anymore. Yeah, when it comes to corn, what we're shooting for with herbicides is we're trying to tame the weeds so that our corn can get to canopy. Because once the corn gets to canopy, then it's its own weed control. It's shading out any competing weeds yeah. and it's, it's doing its own weed control. We're so just you, trying to get it to that point, trying to, trying to give it Give those um, those young plants and some uh, some advantage out there. It's really what it is. So trying to use the least amount, and get the biggest punch out of it. That too, since we're talking about that, for those of you not in agriculture that might be a little put off by chemicals or even organic growers and things like that. You know, we think organic's a beautiful thing, but for our operation, in order to stay somewhat competitive and, and uh, produce what we need to produce, we have to use a little herbicide here and there. As long as you're taking the proper precautions and not over applying products, there's a lot of testing done to where um, it, it can be a very safe thing. I just told my dad this morning how some of the stuff under your kitchen sink is more dangerous and poisonous definitely. than what's coming out of these sprayers. There's, uh, there's definitely some products, but 95% uh, of this load is water. 
and then you think of the large area it's spread over, it's quite diluted. I remember the first class we had to go do, I think I was, I just graduated from high school in 85. And my dad said, you're gonna be our spray guy. He didn't wanna go to some school. <laughs> he, was, he was already past those years of doing that. So anyway, that was the first time they required licensing to, to handle products or to, to apply products. So I, was, I had to manage all that. And uh, they required us to keep like records so that if somehow uh, someone's well would have some, something in it that foreign like that, they would be able to trace back to where it could have maybe came from. Yeah, so your crop records, you would have the rates you put on and where you put it and the years you put it there and the you know, all the dates and everything. They were really firm on that. In recent years, I haven't heard a lot about that. I think maybe we're getting better about yeah, it. Yeah, there's so much information and there's so much training behind it. Dad has its, his private applicator license for Wisconsin. I have my commercial one for my off the farm job. And there's a, that's not an easy test to pass. There's a lot of information in there for our safety and the public safety and, and how to run your equipment. And um, that too, uh, with equipment within the application world, there's so much technology and money behind that in avoiding misapplications and the proper rate where this is a, a bit simpler sprayer, which still has a lot of technology in it, where dad has to go a consistent speed in order to get the proper rate Whereas now these half a million dollar machines, it, um, the computer and the pumps, they're doing it all for you to keep everything uniform. There's individual nozzle control and things like that. But you can still get it done perfectly with something like this. It just takes a lot more knowledge. It takes a little more effort. personal, um, you know, I've got switches. So on this sprayer, we got basically three sections. So you got your right and your left, which would be your left, your middle, you're right. And in the cab, I got a small control box with three switches on it, and then you got a master switch. So basically, if you want them all on, you just flick up your master switch, and then if you you come to a field where maybe you get to the middle, and you only got this, you know, little patch or a little triangle, you can, you know, you can individually shut one one side or the other or the middle off, so you're uh, not overlapping if you're not over applying and, and that's so, not only good for for us and our the economic side of things it's good for the environment as well we're not over applying because you, you're you know you got your rate and if it overlaps your rate doubles it doesn't just you know kind of add more <laughs> it's times two so when you were talking about your commercial outfits it they, they got that GPS in those systems so basically your machine makes the first perimeter yep and some have individual nozzles that shut on and off so you can so get you'll down never there. lap so that machine tells itself I'm covering as soon as that nozzle gets to that area that was already sprayed that nozzle starts shutting off as you start lapping on which over hundreds of acres that saves a lot a lot of money a lot of money and uh, gets you uh, more accurate for all the product that you're using so everything is put with well so I think back in the 80s, that was probably a big concern that uh, they would just sell this product and then who's using it, where's it going? Our containers, um, we got, you know, disposal sites, we gotta make sure all that stuff, you know, gets back, you know, and recycled properly and all that. You double, triple rinse, they got, the, you know, there's all sorts of, you know, like we're buying it in small amounts, so it's, it's not quite as big of a deal as like you guys, you guys got those, you know, big totes and, and uh, so getting back to the consumer, what always bothered me is I can go to Walmart and buy Roundup in a container to spray around my yard and I don't need a license. And there's no real way of knowing, you know, you, you could spill it and oh, well, you know, nobody sees or knows. We're here, they're watching us and they, we have to answer. Yeah, so just to ease any of your guys' minds, it's, it's not, uh, farmers aren't just out here just willy-nilly throwing product away that could harm the environment and getting rid of stuff because at the end of the day, we're, we're trying to make money, so if we over-apply or overuse chemical, we're, we're wasting money, so we don't, it's a business, we don't I mean, want to do that. So, that. so you can't have it both ways, really. I mean, you, it really comes down to the fact that if we all go organic, it's all great, but you consumers are gonna be paying for the food. I mean, it's it's gonna be double and then some. I mean, it has to be. You know, and the thing is, food is, well, we have to have it. Yeah, what's, a, what's the difference per hunter for organic milk versus chem 
Well, I do I do know a few different organic farmers. So let's say we're at, I don't know, 18, 19, it's flopping around quite a bit. I mean, they're, they could be in the high 20s, low 30s even. So if they were to buy like corn or any kind of proteins or anything, their, their market for that is way off the charts compared to your conventional stuff. Now, all in all, what we're trying to say is all the different ways of farming is a beautiful thing, but to feed the world, we got to do some more of this commercial stuff in order to make it economical and get things done. But we think uh, it would be beautiful if everybody could just provide their own food for themselves. And I think that's usually simpler. the key of it. Get some chickens and some different stuff and do your back, backyard thing. And, and then your fraction of what you're depending on, what you don't know how that got raised is less. Yeah. But we got to keep working here. We got to get the sprayer ready to go and, and get out there and and take care of our uh, take care of our corn. So another thing they taught us on the, one of the first classes I've been to is like, you know, your garden hose or whatever you're filling your tank. You never want to put that hose inside that that chemical. You always want a gap between it. So if, let's say it'd be rare, but let's say your well stopped. This could siphon that chemical back to your well. And that, and that is always one thing. And that's kind of with even our stock tanks and all that stuff. You got these non-siphoning devices or you got that air gap in there. That's kind of a huge thing to... Uh, that's really important or you would have where we would load into a different tank and then that tank would load into our... Yeah, you would have that gap. Yep. We try to don't, don't connect those two things. You don't want to just throw a whole pile of hoses. And then this tank is clear so I can see the water line. You know, you can see through it if you're looking from, especially from a little bit of a distance. So then I, maybe I can go start feeding cows, but I gotta watch it. You don't want that to overfill. Yep. Then you gotta spill, you know, so you're able to, but like you said, if we were a bigger commercial outfit, we would have tanks on the side that are filled already. Huge pump that you come in, you could fill this up in minutes and- uh, Two, three inch, four inch line. And yeah, just... you'd fill up and that's, that's how you'd have to do it. But here, you know, I get, like a board, maybe five tank mixes, and I, I'm and you're done. I mean, and then we clean her up, put it away, and move oh. on to hay. So we just finished rinsing out our sprayer. We took it out to the field and, and primed our booms to make sure that there was no residue in there. We did that three times with some tank cleaner, and uh, did that right on the edge of the field so that um, if we were going to hurt anything, it'd be in that field we're already applying in. And that prevents for when you take off on your first pass, in case there was any Roundup left in those booms on this conventional corn, you could see where the product was slowly leaving the boom. So we did that in order to protect our crop and make sure our sprayer was cleaned out. Now we're doing the math on what we're gonna need to put in for chemical for our, our load. So we have a 200 gallon, yeah, we have a 200 gallon load. So there's gonna be 16 ounces of one product or you know, a pint of this, quarter of that. Try to get it as it's, accurate it's like, as we can. So where we buy the product, usually those guys are very, you know, they're, they're experienced with all that. So what we do is they give us advice on what to use, what they think would work best for our soils. Because lighter soils, the rate's got to be way less, like sand. Yeah. Versus heavy organic matter. And your rate gets a little bit higher because it's, you know, just, it's not going to work. So you, you want to be sure you put enough on that it's going to work so you don't have to do it again. Because yeah. if you have to do it again, now you're really up in your rate. So you want to put enough on, but not too much on. And um, so a, anyway, there's a happy medium in there. There's a oh, you got to be accurate. So we're going to be measuring with the jugs if it's a larger amount, and then with a, a measuring cup. If and they it's they usually give amount. you like a picture with um, the ounces on there, and yeah. you can fill it. You can see through it. You see right where it's at. Dump it in, rinse it out, all that stuff, so you don't end up. Uh, you know, and then you had a little time to think because the sprayer's got to fill. All right, we got all our products in. We're uh, finishing filling water. Daddy's got the tractor going. We're getting the pump going, and we have it. Uh, our valves open to, to agitate right now. To help circulate it and get it all mixed up products we're using it isn't really a big deal but but some of them it matters or you want it to agitate really well
Okay, so we got him going now. He's spraying and he's uh, in between row four and five, I believe. And you guys, I don't know if the camera can see it, but he's leaving foam out there. He's got a foamer on this sprayer. So that's how he's tracking where he sprayed. So then when he goes to line up on the other end of the field, he'll put the tip of his boom right over that last foam marker. So then he knows that he's not overlapping or leaving a skip because you don't want to leave a skip because then that leads to weeds getting out of control and then you got to come back in and spray again but you also don't want to overlap a lot because you don't want to over apply and he's trying to straddle the rows the best he can with the tractor obviously you don't want to run over the crop but the corn is young enough now with flotation tires like that that aren't super super skinny he's not really hurting the crop it's going to bounce right back up it's where that corn gets to be about a foot tall is where you start snapping it off and breaking it and it won't come back but when it's two three inches tall like this right now you can run it over and it'll probably hurt it a little bit but it'll be fine it'll grow back so he's trying to straddle the rows the best he can yet keep an eye on the outside of that boom and keep a consistent speed especially running a manual sprayer like this there's a lot of things going on when you're spraying it all happens so quick where you got to be on the ball and and concentrated on what you're doing so especially in smaller crooked fields like this he's got to be ready to shut certain switches on and off if he's coming to corners or triangles so that he doesn't over apply the booms have breakaways on them so on the right behind the sprayer there there's a, a pivot point which you've seen when we were folding it out with it that's spring loaded so if there was like a telephone pole or a power pole right in the center of the field or a tree or something for some reason and you happen to hit that with your boom you're not going to just bend your boom all the heck there's a little bit of a safety net there where your boom will break away where it will snap back because it's spring loaded and then once you get past that obstruction then it will spring back into place nice little safety net and especially with a smaller sprayer like this where you're nice and narrow it's not uh it's not too uh too often where you have to use a breakaway you can really finesse around stuff and like we were saying we got perfect conditions today for spraying a little bit of wind the sun's out so the plants the weeds are going to uptake this chemical it should have a, a pretty good effect i think the the john deere and the demco look really good together in the comments down below let us know what type of sprayers you guys have or if you're organic, let us know what you use for cultivators and weed controls. I know some of those organic outfits use burners, but we'd be excited to know what type of equipment you use for weed control. So let us know down in the comments. he gets lined up on the end and follow that row so that's another way to keep track of where you've been and what you've already sprayed so like on a big flat field sometimes I'll just put the marker on on the very end so when I turn around I I don't miss it count because usually we counted the rows
Yeah, so this field on the left was a crop of hay that we took out and planted corn in. And you can see he, he burnt it down, I guess you could say, with uh, Roundup to kill off all the hay and that's Roundup ready corn. That's the best way to do it on a, on a no-till sod field like that. Looks like spraying's going pretty well so far. He is just about done with that field, so we're gonna end off the video here. Thank you so much for sticking to the end. Hopefully we educated you a little bit. Give us your opinion of uh, spraying down in the comments. We'd, uh, we'd enjoy to, to read them. Also let us know what type of equipment you use for weed control on your farm. But that's gonna be it. Thank you all for watching. Make sure to like, subscribe, check out our other social media pages as well as uh, our other videos but that's gonna be it we'll see you next time